If you've been around a while like I have, you will probably remember the early days of front-wheel drive cars and some of the problems they had. In particular, you may have experienced a phenomenon where when you step on the gas, the car wants to rip the wheel out of your hands and turn either left or right all by itself. It's called torque steer. And today, I would like to talk about it, explain what causes it, and how it can be mitigated with proper suspension design. Hello everyone, I'm Hubert Mace, and this is Suspensions Explained. Front-wheel drive cars have been around for a very long time. In fact, you could say that front-wheel drive is the original drive layout, since the very first self-powered car, the steam-powered gun tractor built by Nicolas Cugnot in 1769, had the drive system mounted on the front wheel. During the very early years of automotive development, many manufacturers tried front-wheel drive, but few were able to make a commercial success with it. Cord famously used it in their L29 in 1929, but the Great Depression and the perception that the car's top speed of 80 miles per hour was a bit lame kept the car from being a commercial success. Since then, however, the car has become quite a collector's item. Other manufacturers tried it with varying levels of success, but the most successful of them all was Citroën when they introduced the traction avant, which literally means front drive, in 1939. Citroën would continue to use it from then on in many of their successive models. As far as the general automotive market goes though, front-wheel drive didn't really take off until the 70s after the 1973 oil shock drove customers to buy smaller, more fuel-efficient cars, especially those built in Japan. Over time, as front-wheel drive gradually became the norm, demand for more powerful versions led to higher and higher horsepower engines. As power levels crept up, the inherent issues with front-wheel drive started to rear their ugly heads. In particular, torque steer became a real issue. So let's look at what torque steer actually is and how it is generated. Then we'll talk about ways in which it can be minimized through suspension and driveline design. There are two basic ways in which torque steer can be generated in a vehicle. The first is unequal application of drive forces between the left and right wheels caused either by unequal tractive capabilities of the left and right tires or unequal torque coming from the powertrain. The second is unequal left and right half shaft angles at the outer CV joints. Let's talk about each of these starting with unequal application of drive forces. When torque from the powertrain travels through the differential, it gets split between the left and right half shafts. The standard open differential design found in almost all cars assures that the left and right half shafts will always get an equal amount of torque. This torque then travels down each half shaft through the wheel bearings and into the wheels and tires. Now, as long as the tires have the same or similar traction and stay stuck to the ground, in other words, there's no tire spin going on and the grip levels are relatively similar, then the torque on the left and right tires will be pretty much the same. This means both tires generate about the same amount of tractive force. The left and right suspensions see about the same amount of force pulling the vehicle forward. If, on the other hand, one of the wheels is on a much more slippery surface, such as when it is on ice or wet leaves, then the amount of tractive capabilities in the left and right suspensions will not be the same. And here's where the design of the suspension and the differential come into play. If we look at a generic double wishbone suspension, we see that the axis that the suspension steers around is defined by the upper and lower ball joints. This axis is called the steer axis, or kinkpin axis. In a McPherson strut, it is defined by the lower ball joint and the upper strut mount. It's like the hinge axis of a door. The door rotates around this axis the same as a suspension rotates or steers around the steer axis. Now let's look at where the tractive force is applied. If we think about the vehicle as a whole, the force that accelerates the vehicle when we step on the gas is generated between the tires and the ground. But we're interested in what's happening in the suspension. We need to look at the suspension by itself, not the whole vehicle. When we do that, we see that the torque from the engine travels down the half shafts, which are connected directly to the wheel and tire. This means the torque goes straight into the wheel and tire while passing through the knuckle, which is part of the suspension. It does so via a bearing, 
and bearings cannot transmit a torque to the knuckle. It just rotates. It can, however, pass a force to the knuckle. And because this force is the result of the traction between the tire and the ground, as far as the knuckle is concerned, it happens at the center of the wheel and tire. So from the perspective of the suspension, the force accelerating the vehicle happens not at the tire contact patch, but at the center of the wheel. It is critical that we wrap our heads around this because it fundamentally influences the way the suspension reacts to the drive force. Let's go back to our suspension model and see what this all means. Notice that when we add an arrow representing the drive force to our model, we can clearly see that there is an offset between our arrow and the kingpin axis. This offset is called the kingpin offset. It means the drive force is pushing on the suspension not directly through the steer axis, but at some distance away from it. If we go back to our door example, what happens when I apply a force on the door right at the hinge axis? The door doesn't want to move. But if I push on the door some distance away from the hinge axis, the door will move. And the further away from the hinge axis I push, the easier it is for me to make the door move. The same goes for our suspension. The drive force wants to rotate or steer the suspension, and the further away from the steer axis the drive force is applied, the more it wants to force our suspension to steer. Of course, the suspension can't steer by itself because it's connected to the steering system via the tie rod, and this stops it from rotating. But what stops the steering system from moving in response to the forces coming from the suspension? The driver, of course. Remember, though, that both the left and right suspensions are connected to the steering system, and since they are symmetrically opposite, the forces they generate are symmetrically opposite as well. And as long as they are equal, they will cancel each other out, and there will be no net force acting on the steering system. But what happens when the tractive forces in the left and right suspensions are not the same? Then we have a situation where the forces acting on the steering system from the left and right are not equal and there will be a net force trying to push it in one direction or the other. The only thing now keeping it from actually moving and allowing the car to turn are your hands. And that is what you feel when you get torque steer generated by unequal tractive forces. So what can suspension engineers do about this? Unfortunately, while we can reduce the effect of unequal tractive force torque steer, we cannot in a real world eliminate it. Think back to our door example. We were able to push on the door without closing it when we pushed directly on the hinge axis. We could do the same in our suspension by pushing directly on the steer axis, but this means the steer axis has to pass through the center of the wheel. This may be possible in theory, but in practice, it is pretty well impossible because there are a number of competing factions that determine where we can place the ball joints. The main one is the brakes. We need brakes, and they take up a lot of space. We could use inboard brakes and get them out of the wheels, but then we get other problems. Brakes are big, especially in high performance cars. Putting them on the inboard end of the half shafts means they would stick down below the bottom of the car. We could move the engine and transmission up to raise the brakes up again, but we will see later why that is a bad idea. In that McPherson strut, we have the added limitation that the top of the strut can only move outboard so much before the damper hits the tire. If we wanted the steer axis to pass through the center of the wheel in this case, the lower ball joint would have to be almost outside the wheel. Clearly, that doesn't work. There are other considerations too that go into choosing where the steer axis is, like camber in turn, steering returnability, and scrub radius, which gets into braking forces and how they impact the steering system. Suffice it to say that when you put all of this together, it becomes impossible to get to a zero kingpin offset. There will always be some. But we can minimize it, especially in double wishbone suspensions where we have more latitude in where the upper pivot point is located. This is one of the reasons why you see so many double wishbone suspensions with tall knuckles that place the upper ball joint over the top of the tire. You can't do that with a regular McPherson strut, but you can when you have an upper control arm. It's also why we've seen some manufacturers develop a variation of the McPherson strut that adds a secondary knuckle. Ford did it with their Revo knuckle, GM did it with their Hyper strut, and Toyota with their Super strut designs. There may be others that I'm not aware of, but in each of these cases, they added a small knuckle inside the wheel that pivots with the steering instead of the entire strut. 
This allows them to move the kingpin axis outboard because it is no longer tied to the location of the upper strut bearing. I mentioned earlier that there are things we can do in the differential that will help here as well. The standard design of a differential is such that it is impossible for it to apply unequal torque to the left and right sides, even if the traction under each tire is different, or there is wheel slip in one of the tires. This sounds great in our case because it means it is impossible to generate torque steer via this mechanism, and everything we just discussed is moot. However, we could, as some manufacturers have done, use some sort of limited slip differential, like a clutch pack or a torsen design. We could lock the differential like some off-road vehicles do. We could even add a traction control system, which would apply the brakes on the wheel with less traction to keep it from spinning. In all these cases, what these systems do is send as much torque as possible to the wheel that has the most traction. That's great if you want to get your car moving, but it means there are unequal amounts of torque going to the left and right wheels. As we have already learned, unequal amounts of torque leads to torque steer, and unfortunately, the direction of this torque steer will be towards the side that has the least traction. If you find yourself in a situation like this, you will have to fight the steering wheel to keep the car going in a straight line. The bottom line here is that to minimize torque steer from unequal drive torque, we need as small a kingpin offset as possible, an open differential, and no traction control. Of course, this means our ability to accelerate will be limited by the traction of the wheel that has the least grip. Maybe a little torque steer isn't such a bad thing after all. Now let's talk about the second mechanism that generates torque steer. Unequal CV joint angles. You may have heard in the past about a car having equal length half shafts and wondered why they are making such a big deal about it. It gets into the angles of the left and right outer CV joints and how they compare with each other. To understand this, we will need to get a bit engineery here. The first thing we need to understand is what a torque vector is. Engineers use an arrow to show the direction and amount of torque that is causing an object, like a half shaft, to spin. To draw this arrow, we use something called the right hand rule. Here is how it works. Imagine a spinning shaft. Now, take your right hand and curl your fingers so they point in the direction the shaft is spinning. Next, stick out your thumb. The direction your thumb is pointing is the direction of the arrow. It is important to note here that the arrow does not show the direction the torque is flowing in. In other words, it does not show if the shaft is spinning the gear or if the gear is spinning the shaft. It only shows the direction the shaft is spinning in. And if we had a couple of shafts with different torques, we could use the length of the arrow to show the relative strengths of the torques. There are no absolutes here though. A one inch long arrow does not mean a one pound foot torque, for instance. The length is only meant to show if one torque is bigger or smaller than another. That's all. So how do we use this concept to figure out what is going on in our suspension? Let's go back to our double wishbone model and include a half shaft. Now let's imagine the car is stopped and we hit the accelerator. Instantaneously, the engine develops torque and sends it down the half shafts to the wheels. If we look at the left side suspension and apply the right hand rule we just learned, we see that this torque will be represented by an arrow pointed to the outer CV joint. At the same time, the wheel is pushing back on this with an equal and opposite torque, also represented by an arrow pointing to the CV joint, but in the opposite direction. Since both arrows point to the center of the CV joint, they form a plane, unless they just happen to be directly in line with each other, which is possible, but highly unlikely. If we look directly at this plane, we can now do something with our vectors called vector addition. However, with vector addition, the vectors must be head to tail, not head to head like we have. We rearrange the vectors to place them head to tail, and now we can draw a new vector from the tail of the first one to the head of the second one. This new vector represents the sum of the first two vectors, and it lies in the same plane. If we now apply the right hand rule on this new vector, we see that it represents a torque trying to steer the knuckle to the right. It gives the suspension a toe-in moment. 
Notice also that the larger the angle between the original vector, the larger the new sum vector becomes, and the more towing torque we would get on the knuckle. If we now look at the left and right suspensions together, we see that the same but opposite thing is happening on the right side. Both suspensions are trying to tow in, and since the magnitude of the tow-in moment depends on the angle of the CV joints, as long as the angles in the left and right CV joints are the same, the tow-in moments will be the same, and they will cancel each other out through the steering system. However, if the angles are not the same, then there will be a net force on the steering system trying to push it to one side or the other, depending on which side has the larger CV joint angle. This force is what you feel when you get torque steer in a front-wheel drive car, and it's what your hands fight against as you try to keep the car in a straight line. So what can suspension engineers do to stop, or at least reduce, this effect? Unfortunately, since the problem is that we are dealing with a neck torque on each knuckle, there is no offset we can change like we did with the kingpin offset earlier. All we can do is to try to keep the left and right torques the same so they cancel each other out. In order to do that, we need to ensure that the CV joint angles are equal as much as possible. Let's look at the whole driveline to see how we can do this. In almost all front-wheel drive cars, the engine is placed in a sideways orientation with the engine on the right side of the car and the transmission on the left. This means the differential is offset to the left side of the car. If we add a half shaft straight from the differential to each knuckle, we can see that the right shaft will be longer than the left. If the engine is placed higher than the center of the wheel, which it often is, then there will be a downward angle on the half shafts. Since the right shaft is longer, it means that the angle at the right side CV joint will be less than the left. It gets worse if the car accelerates due to the lift of the front of the car. This lift increases the outer CV joint angles on both sides, but because of the shorter shaft length, they get worse faster on the left than on the right. This is a guaranteed recipe for torque steer and is the reason why many early front wheel drive cars suffered from this issue. Driveline engineers quickly figured this out and instead of using a single half shaft on the right side, they added a jack shaft that placed the inner right side CV joint in the symmetrically opposite position as the left. This means that the right side half shaft going to the knuckle was the same length as the left and therefore had the same angle at the outer CV joint. If you've ever heard the term equal length half shafts, this is what they were talking about. This is all well and good in straight line acceleration, where the left and right suspensions are doing the same thing. But there are situations where this is not the case. In cornering, for example, the outside suspension will be higher relative to the body, while the inner suspension will be lower. The outer CV joints will be commensurately different in that case. Also, if you are accelerating over an undulating surface, the left and right suspensions will be at different heights, which could be changing constantly. This will result in constantly changing torque vectors coming from the left and right sides, and there is little we can do about it. It's why high horsepower front wheel drive cars always feel like they're squirming around under acceleration over anything except a perfectly smooth road. It's also why torque steer will always be a problem when accelerating while cornering. The only fix would be to make the springs very stiff so that there is little body roll in cornering or movement in the suspension over road undulations. Of course, this makes for a rather uncomfortable ride, so it's not a very desirable solution. So far, I've only talked about front-wheel drive cars. Torque steer can be an issue in rear-wheel drive as well, but since there is usually not an engine back there, it is pretty easy to keep the differential centrally mounted and have equal length half shafts. Also, because the rear suspension is not connected to the steering system, it is able to counteract any torque steer without impacting the driver. Well, I hope that this was informative. There's a lot to take in here, but hopefully this explanation helped reduce some of the confusion. Thank you for watching, and please join me next time for more Suspensions Explained.